of our speakers for um, bringing up the, a range of very interesting points. And rather than waste time summarizing those, I would like to open the floor to questions and comments. We have about 25 minutes, 25 to 30 minutes uh, for that. And um, we'd also like to hear from our online viewers. So please uh, indicate by raising your hand if you have a question or a comment. I'd be grateful if you could identify yourself so we know who you are. Please. Yes, we should have a microphone coming round. Uh, my name is uh, Femi Apata. I'm an independent consultant. Uh, my question is uh, on Richard's presentation, uh, where he mentioned too many numbers. So what are we doing to use more of qualitative approach in our methodology in the NIST assessment? You mentioned triangulation, you mentioned focus group discussion. There are some information that are in-depth that can only be collected through qualitative means. So what do we do to, to enhance more on qualitative approach? Why don't we take uh, around three, three questions if we have them first, and then we'll ask our, our uh, panelists to respond. So we've got um, Richard. I'm Richard Blewett from Help Age International. Just two quick questions. One is, my uh, following of the needs assessment business is, of those 80 assessments in Pakistan, most agencies won't share them because they're not very good. Actually, within the agencies, the question of quality of assessment uh, is still a major, major issue. Very few agencies have invested, very few agencies have the capacity to do it well. What can we do to improve quality? And then the second comment is about balancing assessment vis-a-vis -vis analysis, I think, uh, and synthesis. So even if you've got 80 assessments in Pakistan, that's still a whole load of information that you've got to bring forward and actually bring some form of analysis and thin synthesis to do. But how do you do that? You've got apples and oranges. You've got Handicap International in one place, Help Age in another place, the World Food Program trying to justify food aid. How do you actually find a way to do synthesis? And I think the work being done on the dashboard is important because we've got to find a way to get synthesis. So I think uh, that question of balancing collection of information vis-a-vis -vis analysis and this whole question of how we build quality in the system, how can we have a sort of 9 or 10 or 11 billion US dollar humanitarian endeavor and yet actually the basic question of, uh, like Randolph said, of people in need and actually what the problem is is still so poorly articulated. I mean, it seems very unacceptable. Thank you. Do we have any any online? Not yet. Okay. Anyone else? Um, let's take this lady here first. Um, my name is Rita Tai. I'm an independent consultant used to work with the British Red Cross as a quality and accountability advisor. The uh, question about uh, involving beneficiaries and being accountable to the people, not just the ones who have the most loud voice and are always there because they, they are mobile and they are educated, but those people who are actually most in need or who want to reach, the problem there is that it takes a lot of time to do that and it slows down the mm. process. And I, I'm uh, bringing this up as, a, as an, a problem we've had consistently faced in, in humanitarian crises. And I'd like to, to see if you have any answers. Is that addressed to the, the wider um, panel well or anyone to in Ocha and uh, to, to James and to, to Mr. Richard, okay? Right. Thank you. Um, sorry, I think there was one more right now. Would, would you like to, to ask yours and then we'll, we'll do another round afterwards. Uh, Michael Paratril uh, from Christian Aid. Um, you know, in terms of the, the whole dilemma we face in the field, you know, my academic minds tell me that I need to be very systematic with the methodology of the assessment process. But now when we manage the program, you know, the need to have the decision, the appeal plan within 12 hours to 78 hours. You know, so, uh, but at the same time, most agencies launch the appeal. I mean, with the Red Cross starting within 12 hours, in other agencies, you know, almost the same time. So how do we make the balancing, you know, especially where we know the fixed numbers we have doesn't really fix the situation with that. So, but my, my only, like, you know, I wonder here, would it be possible for us to have that acknowledgement all along the process? And also, 
highlight the you know all stakeholders, especially educate the donor stakeholders that mm -hmm. you know things are fluid. So there needs to be uh, there need to have some flexibility, and that would be of course you know uh, yeah discussed as we as we proceed. The next area I would like to also highlight, of course, you know we heard in the discussion assessments are to help us to make the informed decision. But we have also seen in some assessment process, agencies would say, sorry, we decided not to respond. So, you know, because especially a medium type of emergency. So like that, maybe tens, at least in 20 agencies might have only done the assessment, and then they all decided because we, you know, it's not a big crisis, but we did the assessment by not responding. The main reason would be they didn't, uh, they were not able to uh, generate resources. So, but some agencies, if they go back to the same community, communities are fed up because, you know, 20 of you came, assist, but did not do anything for us. So how, how do we again, you know, give some sort of guideline uh, there in terms of, you know, uh, from a future perspective for agencies? I have one more question, I will ask later. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, why don't we start with, with Richard, because um, there was one question addressed specific, one or two addressed specifically to you, but you can comment on the others and then uh, move on to Laurie. I have sort of <coughs> a gestalt answer, which will cover some, not all of it, but um, the simple answer is that all the good things that we've talked about here, and there are about 20 good things, each of them slows down the process. So choices have to be made, and what we haven't done is make choices. Uh, so what we really need is less democracy in the process, less transparency. We need a fewer people making decisions that are operative uh, to get things moving. Uh, a little bit of good information is going to be a whole lot better than a whole lot of information that uh, uh, um, overwhelms our ability to analyze. And um, on this point, uh, I think we still are largely operating under the myth that data speaks for itself. Uh, if you just collect mm -hmm. enough data, the answer will be there. Uh, too much data just uh, uh, gives us a deer in headlight situation where we can't respond very well. Um, so I think of two phrases that, that I often use doing this work. First, good is enemy the best, and actually we want good because the best will not be responsive. And the other is, uh, was one of the titles of one of my slides here is that uh, we really have a choice here to be either approximately right or precisely wrong. Because uh, in seeking precise data, we're at a household level. And uh, in a rapid emergency or many other kinds of uh, emergency situations, much of the population is not in households. So we've missed them entirely. And the very sample is biased. But it looks like the numbers are real. Uh, I don't think it's actually that hard to do it right. But if you're going to accommodate everybody's desires and interests, um, you're going to say, okay, you come on board too, and we'll be in the situation of uh, paralysis by analysis. Th what our job really is to do, we say in the first weeks, but it takes us a couple, week, couple months to do the first weeks, um, is to figure out what the story is. People are telling us their lives. We have to be smart enough and communicative enough to say, here's what we know, and here's how well we do or don't know it. And here's who that represents, and here's who we don't know much about. And that's the next step. Um, I think that takes humility about the information we have, rather than uh, elaborate paragraphs about methodology. Um, methodology actually is pretty simple for this stuff. And we should say just what, where did we go? Who did we talk to? How did we get the information? Um, and if we, get, if we try to get less information, we'll be able to tell the story better, including to specify what we don't know. Okay. Thank you, Richard. Lori. No, I, I couldn't agree more than uh, with what Richard just said. I mean, I think it's interesting. The methodology that we're promoting with Mira is based on qualitative information, primarily using purpose of sampling. We're not talking about a household survey. And when this was presented last week in Chiang Mai, one of the donors said, no, we need a household mm -hmm. survey. We need figures within two weeks. All of our funding decisions are made. We can't possibly go with this approach. Or, you know, it was a little bit more nuanced than that. But the message was, you have to give us the figures. And I think what we are trying to do is find a way to tell the story with enough um, detail, I suppose, to inform good decision making, but without trying to promise something that we can't deliver, or could even be wrong, actually. And that really requires an education, as uh, one of our colleagues just mentioned, 
I don't want to say an education of the donors, but a dialogue with the donors so that they can also um, maybe consider a little bit um, whether they do in fact need those numbers within two weeks or whether telling a very good story and a very solid story would be enough to help them make some funding decisions. And I maybe just want to say a word around analysis. I think it's a real challenge for us. It's a real challenge at the sectoral level, but it's an amazing challenge at the intersectoral analysis level. I mean, how do we bring different clusters and sectors together to create a consolidated picture of needs is something that we're very challenged with. We don't have the mechanisms. We have something called the intercluster coordination group at the field level. But primarily, this has been a, a group of cluster coordinators that come together to share information, not to strategically analyze the problem and to prioritize needs. And this is something that we're going to have to spend a lot more time focusing on, is how do we do better analysis um, at the sectoral level, but certainly at the intersectoral level, or else we're not able to really get the clear picture, and we're not able to prioritize, which is something we really need to do. Thank you. Shall we just move along, and along in a linear fashion? James. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, yeah, at the risk of just echoing <laughs> what the others have said, I, I, I think I d just a word on this analysis question and the synthesis point that, that Richard made. Um, there's, there's no uh, particular science to this. I think it does depend on getting the mechanism right, actually, creating the right forum for it to happen, yeah. with as good information as you can get on the table. And by the way, I think it's probably worth saying that here we're talking about, I mean, there are two things here. One is doing common needs, or uh, coordinated needs assessment, I should say. Um, and the other is having a process whereby you can actually um, put all of the relevant information on the table, your pre-crisis stuff, uh, things from other assessment processes and so on, that allow you to do this intelligent <coughs> joining, joining up process, which is what we're, we're as much concerned with that, I think, as we are with the particular tool, right. the Myra and so on, right? Is that, is that fair? Yeah. And I think that's the next thing that we, 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 we really need to tackle, because at the moment we're kind of getting better at deciding, well, what information do we do we really need? Richard's spoken very eloquently about this. Let's not overdo it. Uh, let's not gather information that it was, is not going to be useful for people. Now what do we do with it? And I mean, uh, the, what, the what we do with it I think has improved, I would say, um, but it's extremely patchy and there is no uh, consistent process for allowing this synthesis to happen. So getting the process right I think is the, is the answer. Not, by the way, trying to design a model that somehow allows you to feed in all these different elements and come out with the, uh, the answer, because God knows we tried that with food security, one sector, with WFP and FAO, mm -hmm. and it's almost impossible to do it for now. There is stuff to learn from the integrated phase classification, the IPC mm -hmm. process from FAO here, because mm -hmm. actually they've, they've made some considerable strides in this, admittedly looking more at the slower onset, so it's a... It's mm -hmm. a but there's stuff to learn from that, I yeah. think, on this, I right? Agree. I agree completely. Thanks, James. Randall. Uh, just a very, very few comments, and I must admit, I think everyone has sort of said what I wished I could have said. Um, the, having, having said that, um, just this point, it does take a lot of time, and, and engaging takes a lot of time. But let me tell you one example, and you've heard thousands of these, but let me just give you a particularly poignant one in the aftermath of uh, Cyclone Nargis, when a very well and highly respected donor government came to uh, Myanmar, Burma, and brought lots of pots, cooking pots for the things that they dumped on villages, and this was regarded as a major innovative thing to do. The problem is that for the local population, cooking pots were the only form of currency that they had. And if they could chain trade the, their cooking pots, their remaining cooking pots, with the local traders, then they could get cash to pay the rent. So while now, thanks to this gener generous donor, these people were, if you like, under overwhelmed with cooking pots, they had nothing to pay their rent with. So basically, I think my only point here is sometimes that time is actually worth committing to. It's amazing how many mistakes one can make in the rush and the haste that leads to, I really don't have time to talk to you. This leads to my second point, which I think is really key to this whole thing, and that is basically emergencies are emergencies. I mean, crises are. The Japanese did not expect this thing to happen. 
So one is always, no matter how well prepared, always caught off foot. You've all been there in one way or another. You must know what I'm saying. If it was all straightforward, then it wouldn't be a crisis. So the point is, you can mitigate some of this by at least beginning to prepare, maybe by talking to people beforehand, uh, maybe getting engaged. What has struck me in my own career is that after so much time in Somali, in Somalia, I don't speak any Somali. The only people I could really speak to are people who spoke my languages. How culturally sensitive are we when we try and engage? An old, tedious point, but ultimately, if you're trying to do a needs assessment and you can't communicate, you know, what are you really trying to do? Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have time for more questions. And, uh, oh, we've got a whole stack of them. And we've got some online, do we? OK, shall we, shall we just start with our online audience, since we haven't heard from them yet? And we can run over a few minutes into our refreshment time, if people are happy with that. Um, someone's got a question asking, um, what about including existing knowledge, such as DRR activities that have been taking place in vulnerable areas, or agency local knowledge partners over pre-existing structures and skills, and including these in the needs assessment context analysis? This is rarely done. Sorry? Um, they added that this is rarely, rarely done. done. So right. And, and has that person identified themselves? Uh, yes. Satan? I think that's just their nickname, sir. So. OK. Um, OK, fine. Let's take a Obviously few. Obviously, the head of a DRR project. <laughs> 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 Let's take uh, a few questions before we, uh, we start. Were, were there any others online? Could we have that one as well? And then we'll, uh, we'll get some from, from our in-person audience. Um, is it, this is from Jason Nickerson. Um, in what way do you think that crowdsourced data can inform or augment traditional needs assessments for a lack of a better term rather than replace them? There seems to be a number of limitations to the data sorting through the online noise. In what way can crowdsourced data serve as a trigger for a more in-depth needs assessment rather than a replacement for one. Thank you. Okay, now we had other other people. We had some over here. John? Yeah, hi. Uh, thanks to the whole panel. I thought that was really interesting. Um, I'm particularly interested, my name's John Borton. Uh, I used to work here and yeah. mm. I've been independent for a, a long time now. Um, but I'm interested in, in the sort of the downstream issues, and I was struck by the difficulty of the follow of funding the follow-up uh, monitoring, which which is crucial. Um, so I guess a, a question, I guess, to Richard and Loretta and and, uh, and perhaps perhaps James, um, why is this funding not available? Why is the funding not there? for that important activity. And then the second question, part of the question would be, what about the links with evaluation? Because common needs assessment um, you know, provides a terrific basis for evaluation. So I'm just wondering, as, as the NATF and the MIRA methodologies are, are developed, what links do you have with the United Nations Evaluation Group and with ALNAP and, and with evaluators generally. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's take two more. Yes. Thank you to everyone. Um, I'm Craig Dean from Plan International, a children's charity, and we've been doing quite a bit of work in child-centered disaster risk reduction. Uh, which we've seen in Pakistan and in El Salvador, where young people have been part of the early warn system to get people out of the way. And I'm just wondering, have we considered linking the needs assessments to an early warn system, or to the people that would be in, if you like, a communication tree that would then have, say, five core questions for that initial um, baseline survey? And again, also, back to I would like to hear a bit more on the uh, new technology. So uh, using mobile phones and working with the private sector to perhaps uh, try to target the crowdsourcing of information uh, as a primary and then also a secondary wider uh, capturing of information. Thank you very much. Thank you. One more for this round. 
Yes. Okay. Oh, sorry. Well, we'll take yours after that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, my name is Sandra Martinson, and I'm from Red R UK. Um, my question and comment is uh, about um, needs assessment of direct beneficiaries you're mostly talking about, but then my question is about actually indirect beneficiaries or actually humanitarian actors. Uh, Radar UK, we are, we are a capacity building organization in disaster relief and like at the moment learning from experience in Pakistan, we see that there is tremendous needs of actually humanitarian actors in the in Pakistan who, are, who is actually providing that uh, assistance to the to the communities there are about 5,000 NGOs local NGOs involved in this response who have basically no e previous experience in in the, in such a response so when we talk about uh, needs assessment or just actually implementing program, writing reports, uh, monitoring, I mean, these very, very basic things, there is, there is no this capacity, which ultimately, obviously, influences this efficiency in general about the uh, uh, emergency response. So I'm, my question is, do you think, you know, we should be a bit stepping one, one step back, kind of, before, actually, uh, before we are asking what are the needs of the direct beneficiaries, we should also ask what is actually local capacity, what are the needs of actors in there, you know, to be able actually to, to provide that assistance. Thank you. Thank you. And then, sorry, let's take, uh, it's Scott, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Hi, Scott Gardner from DFID. Um Thank you to HBG for uh, commissioning this report, and thank you very much to Richard for... Uh, drafting it and writing sorry, it. Sorry, it's HPM. Sorry, HPM. <laughs> 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 Very sensitive. Slip of the tongue. <laughs> See how quickly it happens. Where did you from DIFD? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, I don't think that I can disagree with anything that's been said so far. I mean, w we've heard a lot of what's been said um, in the past, and I, I guess that that's a little bit alarming to some extent, but you know, the issues continue and continue, although, I mean, the progress that has been made in terms of the work of the Needs Assessment Task Force and the system as a whole, and some of the, the very important initiatives that support the work of the Needs Assessment Task Force are, are very much welcome. And uh, the lead that OCHA is, is giving to improvements in the system uh, in, in recent years is, is really notable. So thank you very much, Laurie, for, for leading that. and. Uh, uh, we look forward to further improvements in the, in the future. Yeah. I guess just a couple of points in terms of um, some of the things or, or the issues that we would see. I agree with Richard in that perhaps we're missing a trick to a certain extent, not focusing also on complex emergencies. Mm -hmm. I think that that's an opportunity where we can strengthen our working together um, in a more uh, slow time frame. Uh, or in a slower time frame. Um, and I see sort of the linkage to the development of a more strategic cap okay. informed by more systematic needs assessment, which provide the baseline for the monitoring, for the evaluation, for um, measuring outputs, outcomes, mm -hmm. which the system will be increasingly asked to, to provide and to demonstrate what it has actually achieved with donors' money as that money becomes increasingly difficult to source from central governments. So there, you know, linking caps, um, more strategic clusters, that's clear, and clusters have, uh, have, I see, a very clear role to play in terms of needs assessment and the development of a, a response and accountability around that response, and then OCHA's lead role in the intercluster coordination and linking all of that together, working together with HCRC and the country team in developing a clear strategy. And that's hugely ambitious, yeah. <laughs> but I think He's you know uh, we, we need to define where we want to go, and we need to be clear about that, and we mm -hmm. need to. I agree the time frame, three to five years, you know, it's going to take five <laughs> years to get there. But let's map out where we want, identify what we want, map out where we want to go, 
and just measure ourselves along the way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, beneficiary's voice, we, we've heard that. I think it, it, you know, participatory approach, it, it, it's a challenge. It's something that the system has got to improve on. <coughs> uh, that's clear. Accountability to a host government in natural onset emergencies, uh, not natural rapid onset uh, emergencies. Uh, clearly, also others. Um, obviously, clear challenges there in working with certain, you know, authorities in certain contexts, and that would have to be obviously need to be adapted. Um, I think that those are the main points. I guess in terms of you know, secondary data collection, we've got a d the development of an at-risk list of countries of natural disasters. Maybe that's a starting point. And from that, then collecting the secondary data in, the f in those contexts so that that is readily available should an emergency occur. Maybe that's part of our, or should be part of our broader contingency planning uh, and link into the early warning systems. Um, and then just finally, the HER has been mentioned, the Humanitarian Emergency Response Review. Uh, just to remind people, it was commissioned by the Secretary of State for Development, Andrew Mitchell, but it's an independent review. It's not DFID's to review. It's uh, Paddy Ashton, Lord Ashton's review. And the UK government is in the process over the next four or five weeks to develop its response to the review. Um, so we look forward to being able to provide that to you in due course. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, I think we'll ask our panelists to respond now. And bearing in mind that I know, Richard, you, having come all the way from Bangkok without any sleep and presenting, <laughs> he's now going to leave because At he's got to go back to the States. So why don't, if, if, you're, if you're happy for me to let Richard go first again in case he has to slip out, please go ahead. Um, yes, it is worrisome. We've been saying a lot of stuff for a while. <coughs> I think we still have a top-heavy process that uh, ends up seeking too many goals, too many goods, uh, and making too many demands on our capacity to respond. I think the dashboard is too heavy. Uh, I think even the mirror as it's developing is probably too heavy, what I've seen. I think we should be doing a dashboard light based on local information. I think it takes 24 or 48 hours to collect an awful lot of secondary data for almost every country in the world today, which is already available. And we ought to be using these sources more. Uh, we should seek, uh, in the first instance, to shine a light on particular vulnerabilities, geographic areas that are uh, important in one area. And that should be guiding us as to where we should be focusing more. When we try to do too much, it takes too long, and then we don't get a focus before we start collecting too much information. Overall, it's too bad Scott left the room, because overall, I think the donors have been better than the humanitarian agencies on this stuff. I think the donors are asking for good information, and I think a lot of agencies are resistant um, to going beyond their own personal professional interests. And about noise, I actually don't see a whole lot of noise on the internet. I see imprecision, and that's not a problem, methodologically speaking. The biggest noise comes from agencies and the press. Um, agencies which are trying to portray an emergency as the biggest problem ever in life because they need to meet their payroll. And uh, from the press because they need to have a story. And if we are not actually asking people in the field and developing quick, realistic bits of story from our, having our ear to the ground, they'll develop a story from what the other press guy said. So un until we get some good basic information saying, here's what we know and here's how well we know it, we're giving it over to CNN or Fox or whoever doesn't have money for payroll. Um, so lighter, lighter, lighter. Uh, we don't have to know everything. We just have to be honest about what we do know and say, here's how we can go from here. Um, and doing so probably is the only way we'll get from an initial assessment to ongoing tracking of what's going on. Um, I, I do, like John, think that this is, this is a big opportunity and we haven't gotten there because we haven't actually done the initial ones well yet. Thanks. Thanks. All right. Yeah, maybe just three points. Um, one on preparedness. Uh, we think that's really critical. And 
There's a new approach that's been developed called the clipper. I don't know if you're familiar with it yet, but it's, it's basically an approach whereby we have interagency teams that go into a country and review what preparedness measures are in place and where there are gaps. And we're working on this right now. We've just carried out a mission to Myanmar, and we have another one planned for, uh, sorry, we've carried out a mission to Mongolia. We have another one planned for Myanmar and another one for Papua New Guinea, in which we send in then specialists to really help to, um, set that team up in the field and the country, uh, the government, to be better prepared to do assessment work. And we're in the process of developing a annex to the operational guidance on preparedness right now that essentially is how to ensure better preparedness um, in the field. But we're doing that in a larger effort so that general preparedness includes assessment preparedness. But indeed, we think that's a really a very critical area of work. And just an, a word about monitoring. Uh, one of the discussions that we've had most recently is transforming the NATF into the NAMTF because people feel very strongly that we should not be looking at assessments in um, isolation of monitoring and that there needs to be a lot more work carried out at the interagency level and in the field around monitoring. And so this is definitely an aspect that we're taking uh, very seriously and we're moving in that direction clearly. Uh, maybe another quick word about uh, the point that James raised, which is really important, and it's about the cap. Right now we have a team in Haiti looking at how to do a multi-cluster assessment to inform the revision of the cap. Now this is not a sudden onset emergency, but the cap was not developed initially with a very good evidence base. But we don't have a tool for that. We don't have an agreed methodology. So we're developing it from scratch in Haiti as we speak. But certainly it's an area of work that we're planning to take on board. And maybe just a, a final word about the online noise, as it's been called. We've had a great experience uh, working with the online technical community, crisis mappers, um, for Libya. And this was a group of hundreds of online people who got together and started to do crowdsourcing and maps and develop tools. And OCH has been working with them through our information management team to see how do we harness this expertise that's out there, that's available through the internet to the benefit of the humanitarian community. And in the case of Libya, this online community volunteered to collect the key, uh, the baseline indicators for Libya. And so <clears throat> we have identified over 100 indicators and they trolled through the internet for a week and came up with the best available baseline information. That's a service that's completely free to the humanitarian community, which we then provided to the clusters for validation. And of course, there were some problems with the data. It was out of, base, out of date, some of it. <coughs> but it was a remarkable resource to have at our disposal. So we have to find a way to work with this and to benefit from it, because it's not going away, and we don't want it to go away. But we have to be also clear not to have too much information because then it becomes a question of how, you know, how do we sift through this and find what's relevant. So this has been a very good experience for us, uh, uh, the online technical communities crisis mappers for Libya. And we'll see whether we do something similar in the future. They mobilize for a week at a time. They all have day jobs. One of them's an air traffic controller at Heathrow. Another one's a professor at some university. And they provide the service through the internet. And it's really ex exciting as mm. long as we're able to figure out the best way to verify the information. Mm. Very interesting. Mm. Thanks, Laurie. James. Um, yes, briefly, two things. One is this question of the, the link between assessment uh, and monitoring, and indeed monitoring and evaluation. And evaluation. And I'm happy to, I don't know how you're going to get the acronym down there, uh, <laughs> if, we, if we extend it to, to uh, evaluation as well. But mm. I, anyway, it's a, it's a really important point. And, and um, I. Th I've been trying to persuade people that we, we need to think about these things from early warning through needs assessment, through monitoring to evaluation as part of a piece, a sort of diagnostic piece, if you like. And, the, and we, 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 I mean, just to take an analogy, in the medical field, you know, they invest a huge proportion of their overall spend in diagnostics, far way more than we ever do, something like a third. Oh, Richard will cor cor correct me, but it's, it's huge in proportion to the treatment, the, the amount spent on treatment. Mm. Now, as it happens, doing this in our field is, is relatively cheap. We just don't invest quite enough in it, mm. and we're not systematic enough. But I think the link between these things is, is absolutely critically important. And I said a little bit about the link um, between assessment and, and evaluation, John. I agree with you. I think this is, this is crucially important. In a way, to me, diagnostics is all the ways in which we understand the context, we think about how to respond to it, and then we think about the impact that we have on that context, and we learn through that cycle. And yet, we chop it up. We treat these as quite distinct functions. They're not. 
They shouldn't be. So I think we just need to that's, we just need to get beyond that. Um, briefly, the, the, to reply to Sa uh, Sandra's point, where's Sandra? Just Sandra, there you go. <laughs> um, really good point about the relief actors on the ground and, and, and their support needs. Um, we so neglect this. We're not good, at, by the way, at assessing capacity. We sort of assume a vacuum of capacity still, amazingly, both in terms of government, but also in terms of local actors. And yet, who are the people who are actually responding front line? Uh, it's the local actors. I, one of the best things I think I ever did at Oxfam was to, I mean, a very simple thing, it was to give a grant to some partners in Bangladesh for boats, so I could buy boats to be ready to do the thing we knew they would have to do anyway. Um, so a lot of this is actually also about support, pre-crisis pre support, to build up really basic, uh, help partners build up really basic capacity. But of course it's not just about partners. I mean, we tend to see the world through our eyes and our need for partner agencies. Most of these are not going to be partner agencies. It doesn't mean they don't need support to do what they do. So I agree with you. I don't think we've taken that enough into account in our thinking about assessment capa uh, assessing capacities. Mm -hmm. Right, and again, last but not least, <laughs> Thank you very Randall. much. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, let me just say, I think despite, um, I, I think, a certain degree of very positive experience with crowdsourcing, et cetera, that it is an issue that I think we're going to increasingly have to focus on, particularly in terms of needs assessment. And it's not what, if you like, agencies can garner. It is, if you like, that wide mass, that increasing array of actors who will not, if you like, accommodate your interest or what you're asking. It will be that uh, person in some refugee camp who calls up his cousin in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and says, WFP is completely lying. We haven't received food in weeks. Prove it. So noise, it's a problem. And it will increasingly be. And then finally, if I may just say, Yes, I think we have to train the 5,000. But I think there's another aspect to needs assessments that may increasingly be of interest. What are the parallel impacts of a country where, for example, is hit and it has consequences for a whole variety of reasons? Collapse of insurance, collapse of, if you like, income, et cetera, where you're having not the direct impact of a volcanic eruption, but if you like the indirect consequence and the effect that that will have on populations well away from the event itself, and how will you begin to analyze that? Anyway, thank you very much, Wendy. Thank you, Randall. Well, we're, we've run over time a little bit, but uh, I think it was worth it because we had a very interesting discussion. I'd like to thank our panelists, especially uh, Richard and, no, and Laurie. I don't have, think it's especially us. I think it's all of you who are interested in this stuff. Yes, but having come, uh, Laurie's come from Geneva, and uh, Richard, as I said earlier, and he said earlier, from Bangkok. So we really appreciate that. But, but thanks to all of our panelists and to you and the audience and also the online audience for uh, joining us today. Um, I just want to say for HPN, look out for our next issue of the Humanitarian Exchange, which is focused exclusively on partnerships. I'm co-editing this with Rachel Houghton, who's actually in the, in the audience today. And we've also got another issue coming out at the end of July of the Humanitarian Exchange focused on humanitarianism in the Middle East, which I think, uh, I think should be a very interesting issue. <laughs> and uh, I, I think that's, uh, that's all for today. So we'll sign off. And please join us next door for some refreshments. Thank, Thank you. you very much.